Good day and welcome to UPL's Q1 FY2024 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Radhika Arora. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Shashri. Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the results for the quarter ended 30th June 2023. The presentation, press release and the financial statement has been made available on the website and we take as having read the safe harbor statement. From the management team, we have with us today White Chairman Rajendra Dara. CEO of Global Crop Protection Business, Mike Frank, CFO Anand Vora, Chief Supply Chain Officer, Raj Tiwari, and other members of the leadership team. With that, let me now hand it over to Anand. Anand. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Radhika. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today. I'll begin by discussing the key financial highlights for the first quarter, followed by an update on working capital and debt. The global crop agrochemical market is going through a tough phase over the last couple of quarters. As for the most recent S&P global estimates, the market is expected to degrow by approximately 5% for the calendar year 2023. Our first quarter performance too was impacted by the industry-wide slowdown as well as by the erratic monsoon in India. Consequently, revenues for the first quarter were down by 17%. Contribution margin improved by 200 basis points to 45.7%, led by higher share of differentiated and sustainable products, a favorable geographical mix, and an improved margin delivered by the seed business. Overall, contribution profit was lower on the back of lower sales, but we did see a 200 basis point improvement as a percentage to sales. Our SGNA went up marginally by 5%, bulk of this increase being due to translation of financials in rupee amidst depreciation of rupee against the US dollar. However, with the drop in sales resulting in a drop in contribution profits, there was a significant impact on absolute EBITDA. The EBITDA for the quarter stood at 1,593 crores, showing a decline of 32% over that of the previous year. While the performance of our crop protection business came under pressure, it's worth noting our seeds business platform performed robustly, with revenues increasing by 26% from INR 840 crores to INR 1060 crores. At a 50, showing a 54% growth, sorry, showing a, a, a good growth in revenue and a 54% growth in EBITDA. The strong performance of the seed business was supported uh, the profitability, overall profitability for the quarter. Net finance costs rose by 36% despite the decrease in debt and non-recourse factoring. This was primarily due to rise in benchmark rates by 350 basis point year on year. The average cost of borrowing for Q1 FY24 stood at approximately 6% per annum as compared to 3.5% per annum for Q1 in FY23. FX loss for the quarter was 200 crores. This was mainly due to cost of hedging contracts against advance orders taken in Brazil. Additionally, there are certain countries where we could not hedge currencies such as Russia and Turkey. Devaluation in currencies of these countries also led to higher FX impact. Net profit for the quarter came in at Rs 166 crores as the impact of higher finance costs and FX loss was to the extent offset by lower taxes as we benefited from the lower tax rates due to poor business performance in some of these countries mentioned above. The tax rate for the year is expected to be at the lower end of the guidance, 
of 15 to 18 percent given at the beginning of the financial year. As we highlighted at the Capital Market Day in May, improving our cash flows and strengthening our balance sheet continues to remain one of our key focus areas. In line with this, we reduce our net debt in US dollars by 160 million from dollar 3.35 billion in June last year to 3.19 billion as of 30th of June 2023. Additionally, we also reduced the non-recourse factoring significantly by US dollar 250 million on a year-on-year -year basis. The receivable secu uh, securitized stood at 890 million as of 30th June 2023 against 1.14 billion as of 30th June 2022. Coming now to working capital, the working capital days increased by 14 days year on year to 122 days. This was primary on account of lower payables and a reduction in factoring as I spoke earlier. In rupee terms, the factoring was down by 1,700 crores versus last year. Overall, we expect to end the year with working capital of 65 to 70 days. To give you an update on the corporate realignment initiative, during the quarter, we transferred our specialty chemicals business to a wholly owned subsidiary, UPL Specialty Chemicals Limited. This proposal this proposed transfer has been approved at the shareholders meeting in July and the transaction is expected to be completed in next few months. The carve out of specialty chemicals business will allow us to accelerate growth in, in that business and enable improved access to capital. Moving ahead, as we look at, for the rest of the year, while Q2 will also be we see subdued demand, in the second half of the year, the demand on the crop protection side is expected to recover as channel inventory approaches a near normalized level. Further, protecting our profitability in the current environment is of foremost priority. Accordingly, we have undertaken a cost reduction initiative of US dollar 100 million over the period of next 24 months, of which we expect to realize at least 50% by the end of this financial year. Overall, led by gradual recovery in crop protection demand, supported by continued healthy performance of seeds business and the implementation of cost optimization efforts, we expect the revenue growth for FY24 to be in the range of 1.5%, uh, 1 to 5%, and a bit of growth in the range of 3 to 7%. On the cash flow and balance sheet front, our focus for generating healthy free cash flow and deleveraging will continue. With this, I'll hand over to Mike to give us more detail on the market condition, on the global market conditions, and also a quick update on some of the key geography. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Anand. Hello, everyone. As highlighted by Anand, the global crop protection business has been facing a tough market environment over the last two quarters. While ag chem demand at the farm gate level continues to be strong, the industry is facing unprecedented challenges due to significant price decline for most post-patent products, combined with distribution channel destocking, which greatly impacted product sales in this past quarter. Even though the current grower demand will absorb existing channel inventories in the next several months, this is a major price point for manufacturers. It is, however, worth noting that our product share at the end user level has increased in certain segments, demonstrating the strength of our portfolio and commercial strategy. Moving to results performance, Q1 of FY24 was impacted by the overall volume decline and pricing pressure largely in the herbicide segment. Herbicides such as glufosinate, glyphosate, clethodum, and esmetulochlor, especially in North America and Brazil, accounted for roughly 75% of the total quarterly revenue decline this quarter versus last year. Our Q1 revenue dropped by approximately 24%, while contribution margins were down around 
margins were impacted by lower prices, resulting in 380 basis points compression versus last year, while EBITDA also declined by 65% year-on-year. Despite the tough environment, we have grown in our differentiated segment by 10% through new launches such as Evolution and Ferrosi. This has also resulted in our improved product mix in this segment from 24% last year to 35% in first quarter. Further, our NPP Bio Solutions have also improved margins on a quarter-over-quarter basis. This clearly demonstrates our commitment and focus to improving our overall business quality. The strength of our differentiated and sustainable portfolio will continue to be demonstrated throughout this year. Taking a look at regional performance for the past quarter, in Latin America, our revenue declined by 28%. Brazil was impacted from significant market degrowth specifically in non-selective herbicides, due to price decline. We did experience growth in Mexico and Argentina versus last year, driven by herbicide volumes. However, the impact from Brazil drove the overall revenue decline in the quarter from this region. In spite of our quarter challenges, through our increased customer focus and our strong product uh, portfolio, we are increasing our market share across this growth region. While Q2 will still see some challenges, we anticipate growth in the second half of the year in Latin America. Now moving to North America, sales of herbicides to channel partners slowed considerably versus a year prior. Overall sales and usage at the grower level in the U.S. and Canada was strong. However, distribution channels were focused on drawing down inventories in part because they were seeing prices fall and therefore, they only purchased on an as-needed basis. Herbicides such as glufosinate, esmetulichlor, and clethodim were most impacted with headwinds from lower volumes and pricing pressure. While this trend will persist in Q2, we expect partial moderation by key insecticides and fungicides such as mancozeb. Our differentiated and sustainable segment led by NPP products and new launches is poised to mitigate post-patent price decline. We have also seen an increase in California rice acreage, which provides a a nice opportunity to drive sales in that market. We do expect North American distributors will be restocking for next season during Q3 and Q4 of our fiscal year. In Europe, revenues declined by 19% in the quarter due to channel inventory concerns and degrowth in countries such as France France, and the impact of product bans. While these concerns will persist in Q2, we see upsides in sulfur and copper-based fungicides and in herbicide volumes in the second half, which are expected to lead overall recovery in the region. The rest of the world was down by approximately 10% due to high price pressure from China competitors, especially in Southeast Asia and Africa. I would like to highlight that we grew strongly in China, nearly doubling our revenue through insecticide, fungicide, and soil and seed health volumes. Looking ahead across the global crop protection business, we anticipate Q2 to remain weaker than last year due to continued channel destocking in Brazil specifically and the global reset in prices in the post-patent segment. As previously mentioned, Recovery is expected from Q3 onward through normalization of channel inventories and demand for herbicides and our new launches as key growth drivers. Further, we're undertaking stringent overhead reduction actions. These measures are expected to positively impact by around $100 million in the next 24 months, with at least 50% of that being realized this year in FY24. So while Q1 was a challenge, The strength of our supply chain assets and our overall strong grower economics, which is driving end-use demand, plus our proactive cost actions and new product revenue growth, we foresee EBITDA growth in the second half of this fiscal year. With this, we'll now open it for our Q&A session. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. 
Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchtone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have a first question from the line of Abhijit Akela from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for taking my questions. Um, while you've alluded to a subdued outlook for 2Q, um, it would be helpful if you could uh, please help us understand maybe the rough range within which we might expect revenues to be under pressure for the quarter. And then also just to check on the uh, revised guidance for the full year. Um, if I'm doing my math correctly, it seems to imply that in the second half of the financial year, uh, the ask rate, the implied growth rate would be, you know, probably not of 15% or so. Uh, and given that, uh, you know, probably require 20 or 25% volume growth to achieve that, given that pricing is probably going to be negative to the tune of at least, uh, you know, 10% points or thereabouts. So, uh, would you expect, uh, you know, that sort of volume growth to be an achievable target in the second half? Thank you so much. Yeah, very good. Thank you for the question. I'll, I'll take the uh, Q2 question and, and pass the uh, four-year guidance question to Anand. Um, so I would expect in Q2 that we'll see somewhat of a similar price decline that we saw in, in Q1, which is in that high single-digit range. Um, and so that is likely to persist in, in Q2 for us. I think volumes won't be nearly as impacted as they were in, in, in Q1. Um, so that would kind of give you a shape that, you know, the overall uh, expectation, even though Q2 will be subdued, it won't be to the same magnitude as we saw in, in Q1. Yeah. And uh, Abhijit, coming to the guidance, uh, you're right. We are looking at a volume growth of anywhere between 15 to 20 percent for this uh, full year. And uh, you should also keep in mind that last year, that's financial year 22-23. The Q4, we had a sharp dip uh, in the prices. So we do expect some pricing correction also as compared to those prices as of Q4. So overall, uh, we do believe that uh, based on what we are seeing and our assessment of uh, Q2 as well as of H2, uh, we, we feel uh, comfortable with the guidance of revenue growth of 3 to 7%. And you're absolutely right. It will be largely driven by volume and very marginally by price. Got it. Uh, no, that's helpful. Thank you. And uh, maybe just one other point on which I was hoping to seek uh, Mike's uh, insight. Uh, on the uh, matter of competition from China, uh, we understand that they've uh, increased their capacity substantially in some of your key products. Uh, do you see them reducing their competitive intensity in coming quarters, or would you see the overcapacity there as a, a bit of a structural problem? Yeah, thank you, Abhijit. Um, so, look, I think once capacity comes online, it's uh, it's more of a, a permanent fixture. Um, you know, right now what we're seeing is very low demand uh, coming into the market in China, so exports are low. Uh, again, this... this um, Change in, in buying habits by distribution is impacting, I would say, across the industry, whether they be, you know, Chinese producers or across the, the rest of the multinational companies, as, as we're seeing um, other companies report their results from this past quarter. Um, on, look, on a go-forward basis, I, I think the competition will be intense. Um, eventually, I think the, some of the AIs that are um, have too much capacity, that will get rationalized over time. But uh, that will take, I think, several quarters into the future. So I don't think that's going to happen here in the near term. That being said, uh, we do know that some of the projects that were uh, um, set up for further capacity expansion, uh, what we're seeing in China now is that those projects are being uh, stopped. Um, so I, I would expect that there will be very uh, few projects in the future which are adding capacity. But but we do have some, uh, some uh, AIs where capacity is is very high at this point. Thank you. That's very helpful. And just one last quick thing for me, uh, for Anand. 
Uh, any guidance on the debt reduction and the factoring uh, levels for the full year, Aman? Thanks a lot. Now, factoring, I think we'll try to keep it between 1.4 billion to 1.6 billion. Um, and uh, debt reduction, you you seen Q1. While I know we we didn't give any guidance, but we did reduce our debt by about 160 million uh, in Q1, and we will continue our effort to reduce debt as we move forward in this quarter, uh, over this financial year. Thank you very much, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Madhav Marda from Fidelity International. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I had two questions. Uh, first one was, given that you know, there has been some restocking which has been happening in the channel uh, across some of the key markets, do you think channel inventory is running lower than uh, usual levels? Like uh, if, if it was like X at a, or a usual time, are we running lower than those levels right now? Yeah, so um, look, the, the reality is it's really a country by country, market by market um, situation. I was in the U.S. just a couple of weeks ago uh, visiting with key distributors a across the U.S. and I would say largely the inventory levels are, are at what I would call, you know, normal uh, levels for most companies. There was a few distributors I talked to that still had higher than desired inventories. Now, if you go to Brazil right now, of course, they're in the in the process of gearing up for the upcoming soybean season. And so, you know, I think it depends whether you're looking at northern or southern hemisphere. Inventories at the distribution level, I would say, haven't completely normalized. I would expect that to take place over this upcoming quarter for the most part. Um, but uh, we're, we're approaching those levels. And again, if you, if you rewind the clock over the past couple years, the situation with COVID and then uh, also the, the, the Russia war situation, it did put pressure on supply chain reliability. And so through that period, distributors were generally trying to, uh, you know, bring into inventory products that they could get a hold of. And overall, that's why inventories were built up uh, really on a global basis. And so now we're seeing the other side of that situation where there's no longer concern about supply chain reliability, and therefore, naturally, distributors are trying to get back to a more normalized level. So it's getting close. I think we have another quarter or so of uh, of normalizing this, and then and then from that point, we'll be restocking as per normal. Got it. And our second question was, you know, a lot of the AIs, like you said, uh, and we've seen uh, data around sizing having come down meaningfully in the last uh, uh, six or eight months. Uh, are these prices, uh, would you call them sustainable levels or do you think these are prices where it's, uh, where profitability comes under question? Because there's been a lot of volatility in prices of a lot of uh, uh, products over the last, uh, say, since COVID to now. Do you think current prices are more sustainable or are they like below sustainable levels? Uh, how would you read that? Yeah, I, you know, I would say based on current feedstock costs that, you know, generally the prices that we're seeing uh, are are barely covering feedstocks and probably not covering fully loaded uh, overheads. And so, you know, at that level, that can't persist into the, the mid to the long term. So I do expect that there's going to be, you know, a combination of rationalization and ultimately uh, some uplift in, in prices. Um, again, it's hard to predict, you know, when exactly that, that's going to evolve. Um, you know, right now, because of the, the low demand, um, we're seeing the, the low prices persist. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Sonali Sagarkar from Jeffries. Please go ahead. So thank you for the opportunity. So my first question is with respect to the debt. Could you give us the, in INR terms, the gross debt and net debt figures for Q1 this year versus last year? Yeah. Anand, I have that. If you want, I can say that. Yeah, the, uh, go ahead with the yeah, INR yeah. numbers. Yeah, so Nani, it's, it's essentially on the slide 11. If you look at the quarter one presentation, that's there on the website. Uh, the numbers are 
30,083 crores in June 23, and similar number June 22 was 30,123 in INR crore. However, if you see in uh, you know dollars, it was 3.66 billion versus 3.8, so down by about 147 million dollars. Got it. Uh, so essentially, on a QoQ basis, we have slightly increased the debt. Is that right? That's correct, Sonali. And this is typically, as you know, the working seasonality. capital goes up. Yeah, uh, it's the seasonality. But uh, therefore, we always compare the debt position vis-a-vis -vis the same quarter last in the previous year. Understand. So I understand you are not giving a guidance for deleveraging per se, but any guidance for net debt to EBITDA for the year? Well, uh, net debt to EBITDA last year we closed at about 1.5 times. Uh, net debt to EBITDA. Uh, I think this year, considering uh, very marginal growth in EBITDA, uh, we we should be we we definitely will be below two, but uh, anywhere hovering between 1.5 to. Got it, sir. And lastly, on the product ban in Europe, uh, anything you would like to quantify in terms of what is the impact that you are gauging, uh, and if at all it is uh, going to have uh, an impact on the full year numbers as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. It's Mike here. Um, so the, the one product that we uh, was banned last year that we're not able to sell any longer this year is a is an active ingredient called bifenazate. Uh, it's a very nice product for us, high margins. Last year's revenue was about $24 million. Uh, obviously, we knew that coming into this year, so that was part of our, our planning uh, assumption, but that gives you a magnitude of the product bands uh, on a year-over-year -year comparative basis. Got it. Then last question, sorry, if I may slip one. Uh, the North American sales have declined quite sharply for UPL Corp as compared to the other regions. We understand it's related to channel uh, inventory issues, but any further clarity you'd like to give on this? Yeah, as I said, I, I was in the U.S. just a couple weeks ago. Um, I think our portfolio is performing very strong. Uh, our relationships with our channel partners there is also very strong. So this really is a, a, uh, a correction in uh, inventory levels. Um, as they, you know, get, as you may know in North America, the, it's really just one season. And so they uh, they typically load up in, in our third and fourth quarter, and then they de de delete their inventories, you know, in, in uh, Q1, Q2, Q3. And so um, their sales to growers is strong. Our products are performing very well in the U.S. And, again, I think once we get to Q3 and Q4 stock, uh, stocking in the U.S., we'll see our, our business pick, pick back up. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you and all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Prashant Biani from Ilara Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Mike, uh, in your recent visit to US, how uh, what feedback have you got about the Midwest region? We are hearing about drought-related conditions persisting there. And in that backdrop, how do you see the North American sales for the year? I understand that you have told that sales could revive uh, H2 onwards, but won't that be too early for the industry to revive, given that, you know, uh, then, uh, I mean, that market is sitting on a very large inventory, some people are saying. Yeah, thanks, Prashant. Um, yeah, so firstly, with regard to, you know, the drought, there obviously is some weather impact in certain areas of the market. I was in Chicago, I was in Minneapolis, um, and there there are some of those regions that have had a lack of uh, rainfall this year, yet in other areas of the Corn Belt, um, rains have come very timely. So, um, again, it's very much a, a kind of a county-by-county uh, situation there. Generally speaking, though, I think that uh, North American yields for corn and soybeans are going to be probably near trend line, maybe off trend line a little bit, but there's going to be generally a, a strong yields, which again, you know, if you multiply that against uh, commodity price that growers are getting for corn and soybeans, uh, grower economics are going to come out this year quite strong. It, just to be really clear then on the restocking, 
Q2 is not a restocking quarter for us in the U.S. We continue to, you know, sell into the channel, uh, I would say, on an as-needed basis where uh, certain products are getting pulled. Uh, right now, mo- mostly insecticides and fungicides, more so than herbicides, where we're replenishing, uh, you know, certain distributors. Really, the restocking for next season happens in our Q3 and in our Q4. And, and again, we, we would expect to see a strong strong uh, business in North America come Q3, Q4. Right. And uh, second question on the India business. Uh, how are we anticipating the on-ground consumption uh, uh, after this uh, recent bout of uh, pickup in uh, rainfall for the current Kharif season? Yeah, I, Ashish, I yes. you, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for the question. I think uh, after the June, uh, uh, you know, lack of rainfall we had, I think it's good that things have moved in India and we are seeing good rains now. The only thing is that it's too much rain now in a lot of areas like Punjab, Haryana, and Gujarat where there's a, there's a lot of flooding. Uh, eastern side, we still are deficient. Some districts of uh, Soybean are still deficient and Northern Karnataka is still deficient. However, you know, having said that, the liquidation from here should should definitely increase. I think this is much, you know, uh, much better to what we initially thought in terms of how the weather will uh, pan out. And these, uh, these, these rains should definitely help us in the Q2 uh, liquidations. Uh, lastly, just a short one. Uh, Ashish sir, how much delay is the India business going on? I mean, the season has got delayed by how much in India right now? I think it's a delay, so 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 it's very 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 dif- uh, different for various geographies. If you would see, uh, uh, you know, the Gujarat business that started, but then now it's got delayed because of the flood. Cotton is uh, absolutely okay in time for North, where but the paddy in North is again delayed because of the uh, the heavy floods which which uh, came in the GT belt. Uh, Soybean is uh, on track. Maharashtra is more or less on track. Uh, the Karnataka season will be delayed a little bit, and so will be uh, Hyderabad season. We still, you know, we are we are experiencing uh, some heavy rains. East uh, is still delayed by about 15 days. Thank you, Dr. Troma. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Josephina Rodriguez from Waha Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the call. Uh, two questions from my side. So I see growth that you're reporting now three point six six seven million dollars. In the last quarter, uh, if I look at F one twenty three, it was two point seven. So I wonder if you're like now counting some maybe factoring or what was the driver of that increase in debt. Second question is uh, CAPEX, if you give guidance for it here and if you're thinking of uh, maybe reducing it to preserve uh, cash flow. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Josephina. Uh, uh, as you know, due to the seasonality of our business, we do see an increase in working capital as we move into the, uh, into the financial year. So typically, you would see that Q1, you would see an in- increase in working capital and it peaks in Q3. So December, uh, quarter in December, you the working capital is at its highest level and then we see a drop in working capital in Q4. Uh, so in, in continuation of the increase in working capital, you will see that the borrowings also keep going up and therefore we always compare uh, at the end of the quarter with that of the quarter of the previous year rather than quarter on quarter comparison. So as a result, we when you see if you see our presentation slide, you will see that we compare the working uh, the borrowings and the working capital vis-a-vis the same quarter of the previous financial year, and therefore this increase uh, there is almost seven to eight hundred crores of increase in working capital uh, uh, as we move into the season, and correspondingly the debt has gone up. So that's the reason it's nothing to do with uh, our non-recourse factoring. Uh, which, uh, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't impact our borrowing. Moving to the second question on the CapEx. Uh, certainly, I mean, we had guided for about 325 to 350 million. 
we, we, we now feel that we should be in the range of around 300 million. Uh, we are clearly looking at uh, uh, our capex uh, for this year and uh, wherever we, uh, if we can, in order to conserve cash, if, if we need to uh, postpone some of the capex or something, we, we, are, we are reviewing currently, we haven't taken a decision, but we are reviewing closely and closely monitoring our capex spend for this year. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Abhiram Ayer from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, so, I understand you're comparing the gross debt on a year-on-year -year basis, which is fine, but previous year also had the impact of a reduction in debt due to the equity infusion by the minority shareholders in, during the restructuring of the company. Uh, so, that impact seems to have sort of gone. Is the entire increase to from 2.8 to 3.6 billion driven by working capital? And the other question is uh, cash as well has sort of come down from uh, March to now. So again, uh, could you just quantify a bit, help us a bit on, on the walk in net debt basically uh, on a quarter on quarter basis? Is the entire thing working capital and is it expected to reverse in Q4? So it certainly will uh, get reversed in Q4. As I said, it's Q4 is when we get our most of our cash uh, uh, collection happens during Q4. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about 700 crores is spent on uh, working capital. There has been certain uh, capex spend and other uh, uh, working capital related, uh, I mean, loans and I would say rather the tax and other payments which have been there. As you would have seen, the Q1 has also not been uh, uh, very very profitable in terms of uh, profit generation was lowered by 32% EBITDA and the interest and finance cost had resulted in a dip in the PBT. So overall uh, the, the working capital has gone up uh, during uh, during this quarter but as I mentioned earlier we, we do see uh, in fact in next two quarters also you will see a slight improvement increase in working capital and in Q4, you will see the working capital coming down. So that's, that's been the trend over the last, if you look at last five years, that's been the trend. And we do expect uh, working capital, I mean, the debt levels to be, uh, we, as I said, in Q1, we have reduced by about 160 million in US dollar terms, as well as we have reduced the factoring by about 250 million. Uh, we do expect to continue with this trend as we move into uh, the next two, three quarters. Clearly, looking at the state of business and the market largely, as, as, as Mike alluded, uh, looking at the conditions of market, we will take all measures to manage, uh, improve our cash and uh, maintain our cash flows uh, well and see how we can bring down the debt first. Got it, got it. And in a sort of similar vein, um, the company's bonds are still sort of on negative outlook by Fitch, uh, one of the two uh, agencies which rated investment grade. Um, may, may you just get a bit glimpse on, on what the conversations have been and, and how do you see sort of, uh, you know, evolution and basically time given by the rating agency to sort of uh, get back to, you know, a, a full sustainable sort of business. I mean, current, obviously the current, there is an impact from market effects. Yeah, so we have engaged with the rating agencies and we have very good discussions with the rating agency. Uh, I think uh, the they, the good part is uh, it's, they have been rating various other crop protection chemical companies and though they do know the market conditions. I think in Q4, uh, we, uh, they maintained the rating. I, I mean, they, they were a bit surprised with the performance, uh, but uh, as they later, as you know, more and more information started making available and on China as well as some of the other companies came up with their results. Uh, we do believe that uh, they do understand the market conditions and considering that all uh, if you look at the peer group we 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 have uh, while we have all loss on revenues as well as on EBITDA there has been lower revenue in EBITDA but the drop in our case has been much lower plus this quarter the reduction in debt uh, I think I'm, I'm sure I mean we haven't spoken to them as we have just announced the results but that should be a positive and also, you know, most rating agencies take into consideration the non-recourse factoring and a reduction in non-recourse factoring also by 250 million 
is something which I'm sure they will look at it more positively. But we haven't engaged after the results uh, as of now. We, as you know, we just announced the results. So uh, those calls are scheduled over the next couple of weeks. Perfect. And just one last question. Uh, there is a cost reduction initiative that's been mentioned of 100 million over the next two years. And about 50% of them would be in the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, may I just understand that your revised EBITDA forecast include this cost reduction or is this an upside that potentially might come about uh, if, if, if these are on track? Now we have penned in this cost reduction in our 3 to 7 percent uh, EBITDA increase over that of the previous year. Got it. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot for answering. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Darshit Shah from Nirvana Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, if you look at uh, the question on the India business, uh, so the India business has done fairly uh, uh, okay as far as Q1 was concerned. Uh, while you know, the rest of the region, as you mentioned, are seeing a sort of uh, uh, channel restocking and uh, prices fall. So can you highlight uh, what the situation in India in terms of our product portfolio is concerned and overall general industry perspective on the Indian market? Is, is India also going to be the same kind of Channel restocking and price realizations fall. Yeah, so I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'll ask you here. Uh, thanks for the question. I think yeah. I, so I think India is a, uh, you know, a little bit slightly different uh, in a slightly different position as compared to the global businesses, uh, where we had a very good fourth quarter. Uh, we are facing some of the headwinds that are there uh, in the global business also, but that primarily on the molecules which are more post traded molecules. But I think we have a very high share of proprietary products in India. We have uh, some good brands, uh, some new, some some good new launches coming up. We have uh, our, uh, our number one product, Sonicamid. I think we have a mixture of that which is there in the market. We also have some soybean herbicides uh, which we recently have launched. And we have a, uh, a good outlook in terms of some of the other wheat products and uh, some of the other Rabi products which are there in the market. So I think having a higher, relatively higher share of proprietary products in the India business sort of insulates us from some of these things. Uh, having said that, we have faced a very, very tough situations with some of the products which are very, uh, you know, where where a lot of triggers are pulled from China, for example, glufosinate and acetate and mancogen. But overall, because of the proprietary products and some of the new launches that we've had in India, we uh, have a relative uh, position, but the, you know, once again, that that's relative uh, because we do uh, have to offset some of the negatives that are coming in the uh, in the post patent space. Uh, it is very similar with uh, some of the other uh, companies in India. So I think the companies having proprietary products have fared slightly better, and the companies who are purely into post patent chemistry have really struggled because of because this is one of the very few years where the prices uh, from from let's say February, March to uh, to June have actually come down rather than increase for, for post patent products. So I think which also has led to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, online companies uh, which which also has created a lot of issues in the market for uh, for the proprietary, uh, sorry, for the post patent products. So I think that, uh, that that's one thing. And of course, India is one of the uh, geography in, uh, in, in, in the UPL ecosystem, which is, very, very close to the farmer. You know, it's a pure uh, B2C play that we have in India. That also sort of gives us uh, some insulation in terms of, uh, you know, how we are facing the challenge in the market. So, uh, roughly Q2 uh, for us should improve to, to, to some extent and then I think it should get in better from uh, there on. I, I hope I have answered it. Your yeah, you have answered it uh, really nicely. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Rohan Gupta from Nuwama. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi sir. Good evening and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, the first question is uh, on our uh, the, the presentation you have cited that the farmer level consumption probably has yet not been impacted and it's all about the inventory restocking which is impacting the growth. I'm sorry sir, your voice is breaking. So anyway, we understood the question. Uh, you're you're talking about farmer level consumption and the uh, destocking, right, uh, Rohan? I 
think we have lost him. I think his network connection is poor, sir. Uh, Mr. Gupta? Can you repeat your question? I'm sorry, we lost his connection now. We'll move on to the next question from the line of Matthias Vamali from Blue Bay Asset Management. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I think I'm taking us maybe back to the beginning of the call, but I'm, I'm really sorry. We can repeat a little bit uh, and explain and help us understand the, the weakness in Brazil and then obviously a little bit of how you're seeing that going forward, given that it's obviously the biggest market in Latam and it has a, a meaningful impact. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, yeah, the Brazil impact on this quarter is really uh, related to the herbicide segment, uh, most specifically. Um, and and even within herbicides, it's really the non-selective herbicides. And so with the prices coming down significantly for both glyphosate and glufosinate, uh, products that we sell into the channel in uh, in Brazil, uh, you know, through the, through the first quarter, we were in negotiations with a lot of our distributors. There were some uh, product returns that we had to uh, to consider, and some renegotiations that we also needed to uh, consider in terms of working closely with our distributors to set them up for success going forward. And so that work really took place in the first quarter. Uh, I would say a lot of it's behind us. There's probably still a little bit to do in the second quarter, but but that was really at the crux of, of why the, the situation in Brazil was was so significant. Now, again, if you look at uh, across the industry, um, the, this really was a, a factor that it impacted the entire global crop protection industry. I think softness in Brazil is a feature for every company that participates in that market. Mr. Matez? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. We have our next question from the line of Nitin Agarwal from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, two things. One is, a first on, uh, you know, this Chinese aggression which has come through on some of these non-selective herbicides. I mean, how does it really, uh, does it really make you uh, sort of relook at your strategy for the next three, five years? Yeah, Nitin. So, you know, part of that is, uh, it goes back to how we're looking at overall our, our cost of doing business. And so, you know, we we really do think that on some of these uh, AIs, specifically in the um, uh, post patent herbicide market, that these costs have reset, and therefore we we're also resetting our costs, both from a manufacturing standpoint, but also our our cost to serve our SGNA in those segments. And so when we talk about taking costs out of the business in the range of 100 million dollars over the next two years, it's really setting up our our post patent business to be leaner. Uh, so that we can compete more aggressively. And so I would say that's that's primarily how we're adjusting for this new reality. And secondly, on, secondly, on the guidance, uh, you know, do we, uh, from a year-end debt, net debt perspective, uh, you know, do we have any uh, any color on we're looking at reduction of debt versus the last year levels or on, on, on net debt levels, or, or where do we see the dollar debt uh, ending up? Uh, Nitin, as you see, uh, Q1, we have managed to bring it down by about 160 million. I think, as I mentioned earlier, our efforts will be to bring down our debt further. Uh, uh, as you know, we, we see the, as I mentioned in my even opening uh, remarks, uh, considering the, the industry where it is today, uh, I think it's best to focus on profitability and conserve cash. So we will uh, look at uh, reducing the debt. Uh, in INR terms, it will be a bit difficult to give exact guidance, but upwards are on. I also uh, mentioned that on the capexes also, we are closely monitoring the capexes uh, spent. So everything within our, uh, if I have to say what we control, we will try to see how we conserve cash. And uh, needless to mention, we'll keep reducing, bringing down the debt as we move forward during this financial year. And second, I mean, on the guidance for the initiative you've given out, uh, I mean, given where Q1 and it up, I think it's a pretty reasonable, I mean, pretty positive guidance for, for the full year, to, in my view. I mean, what are the risks that we see that the guidance number of, you know, 3 to 7 percent that we put out on the EBITDA? 
Well, I think uh, we the good part is we have been engaging with our teams across the world with various regions, and we are, we are getting their feedback. Uh, we we mentioned earlier that we will be focusing on the volumes just to ensure that we don't lose the market share. In fact, even in Q1, despite the drop in sales, we we did uh, maintain our market share. So we we remain fairly confident of delivering this guidance. Uh, I mean, it's been after a lot of uh, internal discussions and feedbacks from our regions that we have come up with this guidance. If you see the range also, we are given a broad range just to ensure that we remain within the guidance. It's not, I mean, exiting is great, but uh, make sure that we don't fall below the guidance. So also the cost-saving initiatives, the SGNA, which uh, Mike uh, explained, uh, you know, we, we are... We have taken an aggressive cost reduction drive, and uh, already we are we have started work on it. So we do believe that that should also give us some cushion to ensure that we deliver on our guidance on the EBITDA. Clearly, the uh, it's it's something, uh, especially when you look at Q1 numbers, it looks like a bit of a tall order. But we do believe that we should be in a position to deliver based on the revised guidance. Thank you. Let's take a quick question. The last one. Hey, this is the first, I think, after two very, very high growth years, we'll have one sort of quote, quote, unquote, normalizing year for the business from a top line perspective. Uh, I mean, does it structurally ease out uh, working capital pressures for you? Uh, I mean, how do you look at that from that perspective? Uh, yes and no. I mean, yes, because, uh, you know, the price, the, the benefit which you got over the last two years in the price increase obviously did have an impact on the working capital. As, a, as you saw, the sales growing at much faster pace than what we had forecast or what we had guided for. Uh, with the prices now normalizing, uh, we should see a, a, some reduction in working capital. But, uh, you know, the good part is we are seeing the destocking. And once the distributor starts uh, are seeing the de uh, destocking happening at their level, uh, you know, which means they would have cash flows in and uh, fresh orders also would be in place. So, we do expect, uh, uh, you know, some reduction in working capital despite the growth in revenue, what we have projected for between 1% to 5%. Uh, we do see uh, overall reduction in working capital as we move forward during, for this financial year. Okay. Thank you, Investment. So in, in number of days, it may still remain where it is, but overall you, could, you, you may see some improvements there. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of S. Ramesh from Nirmal Bank Equities. Please go ahead. Oh, good evening and thank you very much. Uh, so in the last quarter you had mentioned that uh, there was a reduction in your capacity utilization in the manufacturing plan. So has the capacity utilization remained the same? And secondly, can you give us some uh, sense of the uh, loss you have taken on returns and inventory? Raj, do you want to take the uh, capacity question? If Raj Tuar is on the line. Yeah, I can I can hear that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, except for uh, your uh, at this side, the capacity utilization in most of the cases uh, have have gone up as compared to last year. Uh, but on herbicides, uh, you know, of course, because of the market pressure, uh, some of the you know, you know herbicides are uh, facing volume uh, pressures, and therefore the capacity utilization has been a bit lower as compared. Yeah, and on, on, the request, on the question of returns, uh, I'll maybe just hit that. You know, so I would say generally, even though we did take some returns in Brazil, for the most part, the return levels are, are quite low. Uh, instead of taking returns, we, we did more renegotiation with Channel. And so, um, you know, I would say that it's not physically bringing back product into our warehouses. Uh, we worked with the Channel and, and renegotiated some of the positions uh, and also then anticipated some future sales with them. And so that was more of a feature that, that impacted our financials in, in Q1. So if I may squeeze in one more thought, in terms of the cash flows, you have seen it uh, reduce uh, substantially to about 268 crores. So based on your guidance, so what is the kind of visibility on cash flows and how do you see that impacting your rating going forward say, by the end of the year? As I mentioned earlier, Ramesh, that uh, the 
the rating agencies are have a good view on the overall industry and they are also rating some of our peer group companies so uh, you know it should not come as any surprise to them uh, i think the q1 reduction which we have seen and which you have delivered uh, both in terms of uh, so you see rating agencies also look at the non recourse uh, securitization program so the reduction in absolute debt by about 160 million as well as in terms of uh, uh, non recourse that's off balance sheet reduction of 250 million i think should have a very well with them uh, as i mentioned earlier to one of the questions asked earlier on this call uh, we we have just announced the results we have not engaged with them we will do that over the next two weeks so we'll we'll hear from them but i do believe based on my earlier conversation uh, overall reduction in debt as well as in terms of securitization reduction uh, should other well or should be viewed positively so can we take it that your cash generation will improve uh, by the end of the year well as i mentioned that's the effort right considering the way the markets are uh, we will focus on cash and profitability thank you very much and all the best thank you ramesh thank you we have a next question from the line of marvin from abrdn please go ahead hi um thanks thanks for the time i just want to dive in a little bit on upl call um just noticing that um ebitda has dropped about 55% margin is also sub 10% um just want to understand based on your projected guidance of 3 to 7% how will UPL call EBITDA change over the next um, few quarters. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give some shape and then pass it to Anand as well. Um, so Q1 traditionally is our smallest quarter, and we would expect that to be the same this year. Um, and so, of course, when we have the, um, you know, our our SG&A is relatively smooth through the uh, four quarters. but our revenue and margins are our lowest in Q1 and so uh, you know obviously when we saw the margin compression uh, and the reduction in sales then uh, you know you get the corresponding significant impact in reduction in EBITDA uh, obviously as we go through Q2 as i mentioned we don't expect to see the same level of reduction Q2 is also a, typically a little bit larger of a quarter for us and then the second half of our year is typically 60% or more of our business and so um you know so we're not we're not providing specific guidance on UPL corp um we will be under uh pressure i think over the course of this year to see uh even a growth but um our sgna actions are going to help and our focus on uh gaining share and driving volumes through the second half of the year will also help us drive revenue so on it i'm not sure if you have any other comments no, absolutely i think that pretty much well explains uh Uh, because always the H2 is uh, heavier. It's a 60-40 uh, H1 H2 ratio, H2 H1 ratio. So we should see the improvement. And uh, you know, as Mike uh, said, SGN typically would be more or less stable uh, for the full year. And with the initiatives that we have taken to bring down our SGN by 50 million in this financial year, and over the next uh, that this year, next year by 100 million, that should also help. to improve the EBITDA as we move forward. Okay, uh thank you. And maybe just a, another follow up and for the other entities like UPR or SAS, Avanta and specialty chemicals business, those have I suppose been a little bit more defensive. Do you think um it's going to remain the the, the same uh, over the coming quarter as well? Well, you heard from uh Ashish our UPL sales uh, business as a CEO maybe a few words from uh, our seeds business CEO Mr Bhupen Dubey uh, uh, maybe I'll hand it over to him Bhupen if you can uh, uh, just give a view on the quarter gone by and the full year performance please uh, thank you Anand uh, the advanta perspective I think if you look at the number of the, the quarter one has been quite robust uh, Uh, it was significant growth in uh, top line, at the uh, bottom line, all the aspects. And uh, uh, good point is that the source of growth are very balanced. Uh, the volume, uh, it's significant contribution, which is about 
uh, in the total the total growth is 26% and the volume growth is 40% price is about 9% and sales is about 3% so very balanced and very robust and very healthy growth and they reflected in uh, the subsequent in contribution profit uh, in a bit now also which is gone by 52% Uh, some soft couple of comments on the crop uh, wise, uh, the field corn, the tropical field corn, across uh, key market like uh, Peru, Ecuador, Thailand, and India, uh, they have performed very well. Uh, the fresh corn in Indonesia, where we are moving from a B to B to B to C, a good demand is picking up in the new arrangement. And uh, uh, another uh, important segment is uh, task is the soil grain program in USA. Uh, which uh, China, you know, great dedication to the U.S. recently, and uh, they they are talking with the U.S. tourism uh, uh, tourism industry uh, to buy to the tune of uh, seven to eight million ton of grain soda for the peak industry and alcohol industry. So as a result of that, uh, their peak up for the grain soda also is quite good, and reflected in the commodity prices. Well. So so these are the key highlights on the quarter one. Uh, well, so quarter two, you know, quarter two. Uh, also, we believe that the the new year in the quarter one, but I think growth should be, uh, you know, uh, you know, definitely double digits. So this well is very good news for today. And and then uh, broadly, when we look at the outlook for entire year, also I, I do believe that the uh, you know the current operating environment for the timber industry is very positive. And for I want to say particularly, our product portfolio is very sustainable. A lot of portfolio whereby we can we can uh, you know deficit will fall in many part of the world like sunflower like sorghum like canola etc. And that is actually the scenario which is evolving is very favorable to us. And therefore, uh, Advanta is poised to have a much better uh, performance than even the seed industry. So broadly, uh, net net positive for seed industry and Advanta. Thank you, Kupe. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Somaya V from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Also, uh, please use your handset. We are unable to hear you. Yeah, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. We'll go ahead, Vishnu. Uh, so this is Somaya. Uh, so quick question on the volume growth outlook that we have. Uh, quite a strong one for the second half. So if you can just help us in terms of. Uh, you know, regions or specifically Latam and NA. What are we expecting in second half, and then, you know, what what should drive us this kind of a volume growth in second half? Yeah. So it's Mike here. In in our global crop protection business, the volume growth is really going to come from really changing the timing of when distributors are are restocking. Um, again, over the past couple of years, distributors were restocking throughout the year. Um, and I, I think now that uh, you know the view is there's no longer risks on supply chain reliability. Distributors want to stock much closer to the season. Of course, on top of that, you've got higher interest rates, and so they're trying to manage their working capital as well. So, um, so that that's why we expect to see, especially in the northern hemisphere, um, really good uh, restocking in our Q3, Q4 uh, business, um, Asia, Africa. Um, again, those businesses uh, take place throughout the year. There's several markets that we serve in, in in that region, and then you know coming into the second half of the year, we'll be restocking for Safrinha corn in Brazil, along with uh, the various uh, markets in in the in Central and uh, America and Mexico that we that we serve. So, you know, we have pretty good line of sight. Again, based on some of this being a shift in timing. Where we can anticipate a, a strong volume uh, half in the second half of our year. Got it. This is helpful. Second thing, in terms of pricing. So, in terms of the pricing curve, where do we think we are? When, I mean, because we've had some five, six quarters of continuous double-digit pricing growth. Uh, so, so the pricing impact. Are we close to the uh, bottom, or is it still more uh, left in second half? Also, compared to pre-COVID levels, where we are today, and how do you think? Uh, Yeah, so the quarter-on-quarter quarter pricing impact is going to continue to play out throughout this year. Um, as we reported in Q1, our price was down about 10% in our global crop protection business. I would anticipate that it'll be somewhat similar in in uh, Q2 and Q3. In Q4, it, it may not be that uh, significant because we did take some pricing actions, 
starting in Q4 of, the, of last year. So, again, I think we've got a couple more quarters where that range of high single or low double-digit uh, price decline is, is going to be seen and felt. Um, and then we'll work out of it coming into our fourth quarter. And, and then again, you know, next year, as, as you know, we'll, we'll see how the China price evolves. And obviously our, our growth of our differentiated and sustainable business will also have the opportunity for us to continue to drive uh, pricing opportunities as well. Got one small clarification in terms of working capital. So when we say we are expecting a reduction for the year, so this also includes the effect of lower factoring for the year? No, factoring, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we said we'll be in the 1.4 to 1.6 range, uh, which is very, I would say, flat as what we delivered as of 31st March 2022. So, and, you know, yeah, so we'll be in that range. Understood, sir. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Anand Bora for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this call. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, kindly reach out to Radhika or you can reach out to myself and we'll be happy to answer. Thank you once again for joining us on this call. Thank you. On behalf of UPL Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your line. Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share and comment.